So we'll start off with the uh, primer talk by Dr. Sanjay Rao on the uh, present day principles in hyperspadias. Dr. Sanjay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramchandra. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Welcome to the city of Bangalore. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be the opening batsman for this two-day workshop. Uh, and I hope that we get off to a strong start and the innings is good. Uh, I stand here before you wearing several hats and I think on the basis of all those hats or after one hat after the other, I welcome you all. First of all, as a, a, a pediatric surgeon from Bangalore, welcome to Bangalore. From the Karnataka branch of the Indian Association of Pediatric Surgeons, again, welcome to Bangalore. And as a participant in this conference, again, welcome to Bangalore. And I hope that you all have a good stay and a very educative workshop. This talk uh, was planned essentially uh, as a sort of laying the ground rules kind of talk with respect to this workshop. Uh, Hyperspadias is a very contentious subject, both uh, in terms of probably every aspect, in terms of how you die, in, in terms of how you operate, how you approach, uh, who does it, when do you do it, where do you do it, etc., etc. So there's a whole lot of controversy. And the fact that we have more than half a dozen to a dozen workshops every year in India on hyperspedias and still there is 200, 300 people attending each workshop just goes to suggest that this is a matter that remains to be resolved and probably might not be resolved and the resolution is probably what is not what you know we are looking at as a one point answer for everything. So this essentially lays down the kind of broad principles on the basis of which this workshop is going to stand and um, a lot of this is material that you already are aware of. I am just articulating it again because they are things that are important and that they need to be restressed. As we go into the operative sessions and the more technical aspects of hyperspedias repairs and the outcomes, etc., etc., we cannot afford to forget what on the basis of what all this stands on. So the ground rules are important and the foundations are important, and this talk essentially addresses that particular aspect. Uh, hyperspadias, the definition all of you all are very aware, hypo below, spadias opening, so when the opening is below where it's meant to be, it is hyperspadias, pretty simple. Uh, the incidence is uh, reported at about 1 in 300 uh, in the sort of standard literature, but there is evidence to say that it has actually gone up by about three times uh, over the last sort of few decades, uh, and this increasing incidence, we do not know why. Uh, it is it indicating that the whole world is turning towards more and more feminization, I don't know. Uh, environmental agents are something that have been described and that have been attributed to and these sort of environmental agents are like foreign hands, you know, nobody really knows what it is. Uh, increased reporting is thought to contribute but not so much, so there's definitely a genuine increase in the incidence of hyperspedias and that probably also reflects a genuine increase in the interest in hyperspedias amongst the medical fraternity because come what may cases are going to keep appearing in larger and larger numbers. Uh, a few of these pictures are taken off standard journals, you all must have seen them before, but again as I told you this is a primer talk, it's essentially foundation laying, so please bear with me if uh, I'm just going over things that are already familiar with you. Uh, technically speaking, if you look at a hypospadias, it's essentially a triangular shaped defect on the ventral aspect of the penis, that's what it is. In its whatever its variation, however it is, ultimately it is a kind of triangular defect on the ventral aspect of the penis. So the ventral radius of the penis, maybe from about say 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock to about 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock is missing in varying extents and that is what and that's the reason why you end up with this kind of a defect. If you start from the top and go proximally, you have the dorsal hood that is essentially an unfurled foreskin that is open like a, like a triangle. Then you have the glands. The, gla the glands itself is misshapen, often smaller and flatter. You then have the yellow that is the urethral plate that is the remnant of the native urethra that may or may not be of excellent quality. Proximal to that you have the opening that is the actual meatus based on which you divide these hyperspedias and describe them. Proximal to the meatus you must remember that though you might have urethra for a varying extent this urethra is hyperplastic. And why is it hyperplastic? It's hyperplastic because the spongiosum which would support it does not exist. So the normal urethra and the spongiosum starts here. As you come up, the spongiosum diverges towards the glands on both sides. Then you have a little bit of bare urethra and then you have urethral plate with no floor to the urethra and then you have the glands. So this is how the defect of the hyperspedias looks. It's an essentially triangular shaped defect. 
What is not shown in this picture essentially are a few other components of hypospadias, one of them being cordy, which is the sort of a ventral bend of the penis, other being torsion in which the testis can rotate either clockwise, anticlockwise, or its relation to the skin of the scrotum. So whether the scrotum is up or down or various elements, so that is not shown, but majority of the hypospadias, irrespective of what its variant, has this kind of a structure. A little bit about the anatomy, I think we need to reassess, we need to revise, basically because this is something that will be spoken about recurrently, repeatedly in the, in the operative workshops. People are going to be talking about various fascias and various layers, so it merits going over it again. As I said, a lot of these terms are very familiar and sometimes loosely used without clearly understanding what it is that we are trying to say. So if you can dissect the penis, and this is a standard picture from many, many textbooks, you have a skin that wraps the penile shaft. Below that you have the superficial fascia or the datos fascia in which lies the superficial vessels, that's the superficial the, the, the sort of dorsal vein, the superficial dorsal vein. And then you have a deeper layer which is the sort of deep fascia which is the bux fascia that invests the, pen the penile uh, shaft completely. Within and underneath that are the deep are the neurovascular bundles. And then you have the tunica albuginea that is the orange which has two layers. The outer layer is longitudinal, the inner layer is circular. The inner circular layer gives off strands into the cavernosa which acts as the support into which all this vascular tissue grows. So we have to be careful when we do, when we are reflecting tissue and we are operating, I think staying in these planes and identifying these layers are extremely important. It makes the difference between a nice, clean, bloodless, edema-less operation versus a bloody sort of messy kind of operation. And I think it bears to remember these layers and I think when, when the surgeons who are operating and demonstrating will make the effort to demonstrate these layers and please ask them so that you are able to identify landmarks well and that is key to most surgery and also for hypospadia surgery. So these are the layers of the penis. As I told you, again another schematic diagram, this is the normal penis, as you can see the skin, the brown is the dartos, this blue is the bux fascia that invests the whole corpora and the spongiosum and everything together. Inside is the corpus spongiosum and then the urethra and then the complete glands. Now, if you look at this, you have the urethra coming and stopping, you have the skin that is deficient from there on, you have the dartos fascia, the bux fascia and this whole spongiosum urethra complex is now a triangular fibrous tissue that goes from the meatus into the glands and this is what causes a shortening, it causes a bowstringing and is thought to be responsible to a greater or less, lesser extent for the cordy. This atretic urethra and spongiosum is on the bux fascia, it is densely attached to the bux fascia and it bears remembering when you are operating in this area trying to resect all these things. As far as you are on top of this, you are not going to enter the tunica albuginea and get a, a, a rush of bleed. Uh, some more diagrammatic representations essentially of the arterial anatomy. Basically the penile uh, blood supply comes from the internal pudendal arteries. On both sides they come, there is a first branch that goes off to the bulbous urethra and supplies the bulbous urethra from both sides and then each artery goes on one of the cavernosa giving multiple branches inside and also circumflex around the corpora cavernosa. So as you can see, the penis understandably is a very, very well vascularized structure. The renewed anatomy, these are Baskin's pictures and all of his articles are full of excellent reconstructions like this, uh, essentially telling you that most of the neurovascular bundles come from within the pubic arch, from the medial part of the pubic arch on either side. They come and they mesh, so you, though you, you find one cord proximally as you go, it becomes a, a sort of sheath rather than a single nerve and these nerves are going along and also on a circumflex manner on all sides. The only area that is free relatively of nerves is a band in the midline on the top and that is an area that you would go to take stitches when you are doing dorsal plications. So this is again something that they will demonstrate to you and I think you must ask when they are doing this kind of operations. This is not so much of a relevance when you are doing hypospadias but it is becomes more relevant when you are doing sort of epispedias and that kind of procedures but it bears, uh, the, the, the hypospedias is a pretty anatomical operation and I think it is important that the anatomy is well defined every time somebody is operating and shows you the, so he or she shows you the anatomy as they are operating. So that's about all the pictures and the anatomy. This is again something that is well understood. The types are essentially based on where the meatus is. It could be anterior if it's on the mid shaft and distal or it could be posterior if it is proximal shaft and more proximal. 
Majority of them, thankfully, are anterior, about 85%. The association of urinary tract anomalies, in addition to this, in this population, is as is in normal population. So you don't need any further testing vis-a-vis -vis the kidney, reflux, bladder, etc., etc. In posterior hyperspedias, the incidence of urinary tract anomalies, say in the kidney, reflux, etc., is higher, and there would be a, there would probably be a, 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 an argument to investigate these people a little further, at least with a screening ultrasound of the urinary tract. I told you that in, besides the factors that we described, there are a few other things. There is cordy that we talked about. Often this penis is small, especially when they are more severe types of hyperspedias. You could have a torsion, and the scrotal anatomy is often uh, quite grotesque, depending upon how severe the uh, penile anatomy is. So these are things also that you would need to assess when you are treating and managing such children. Now, this is the anatomy. We decided how to diagnose, how to label, how to nomenclature. We decided which patients to investigate, which patients not to investigate. Now we come to the fact of how to treat these children. And how do you treat and whom do you treat? Who treats? Now, generally, if you look at literature, it says that for somebody to be able to achieve good competence or proficiency in hyperspedias repair, the team must be doing about 40 to 50 cases annually, which, are, which is about three or four cases a month which is not a very large number if you look at it from the Indian context. The, and I said team, I didn't say doctor, I didn't say surgeon, the team. So the anesthetic care and the post-operative care must be used to handling these small children. So they should be either pediatric trained or at least experienced, especially if you're going to operate in this age group. So if you're going to operate a child within the six to 12 months of age, you must be must satisfy these requirements. The surgeon must be happy operating on these small cases, so he must be doing at least so many cases. The anesthetic and the post-operative care team must be happy looking after children of this age. Caudal block is probably something that all these children need to get. During surgery, few good principles. It is a mic. It's a small tech. It's a small tissue. It's a small baby. It's an even smaller penis. Tissues are very, very small. So you need to have good magnification. You need to have excellent light. Not an operation to be done in candlelight. You need to have clean field. So you could use a tonique. You could infiltrate uh, with one in 100,000, 200,000 adrenaline. You could use a tonique to sub to to uh, you know get this clean field. You have to use good, nice instruments because you're using small 6070 sutures. You use big instruments, the needles break. And when you are suturing, you make big holes in the urethra, you make big holes in the tissue, these tend to leak. So you need to have good instrumentation. That's about what I'm trying to say. You need to have fine instrumentation and fine sutures and magnification always helps. If the penis is small, you could use hormonal stimulation. There used to be an argument about this saying that if you expose these children to androgen, androgen stimulation very, very early on in their infancy, then probably the androgen receptors in those areas are downgraded. And at the time of puberty, they don't respond as well. So probably over a period of time, their androgen receptors are downgraded. But this has not really been borne out and either of these things are pretty good. So you might use a testosterone enanthate injection one month pre-op. You could use topical dihydrotestosterone for one month pre-op. You could use HCG injection. So the various things that you can do. And these are probably something that you might think about doing, especially if you have a micropenis. So when do you operate? The ideal age of operation today is between six to 12 months. But to operate in this time, you need to have an experienced team, team, not surgeon, team. You must be doing 40 cases a year at least or more. And you must have a child who's reasonably well and can have withstand two or three hours of anesthesia at this age group. So if you are able to meet these criteria, this is probably the best age to operate, six to 12 months. If there is a problem here and you cannot do it at this time, probably the next best window period is during this age. Between one year to three years, children are difficult to control. It is difficult to make them understand what is happening. And generally speaking, the results when you operate between these two, the post-operative course is a lot more stormy than it would be otherwise. So three to four years is the next window period that is preschool, especially if your post-operative care is less than ideal. If it's not the perfect post-operative care that you would like, probably this is good age group to do. And there is literature today to suggest that whether you operate at this time or this time, your outcomes are similar. There is no this thing. There was an interesting study from the UK about which was basically a questionnaire study of all surgeons operating on hyperspherias in the UK. They turned out to have about 32, 33 surgeons. About 15, 18 of them were pediatric surgeons and 
about 10 were urologists and 4 or 5 were plastic surgeons and the age varied. The pediatric surgeons would do it at a younger age, the plastic surgeons would do it at an older age and still when they studied the outcomes, the outcomes were similar depending upon either of these two age groups. So the age is not by itself a big criteria. Right, so we have now know when to operate. We have decided that we are ready to operate. How are we going to do it? Again, as I told you, these are not specific operations. These are broad principles. It is useful to look at hypospadias repair in steps, in stages. The first stage of hypospadias repair is essentially a correction of the cordy. The next step is basically to restitute or reconstruct the urethra. And the third step is to restitute or reconstruct all the other missing tissue in that triangle that we described at the start of the talk. So these are the three steps that you would go through in any operation of hypospadias repair will go through these three stages, will go through these three stages. Most of the various techniques are with respect to doing the restitution of the urethra, whether it is MACPA, whether it is you know, uh, snot grass, whether it is something else, whether it is ducket, etc, etc is to do with this. But this and this is more or less standard and they form a part of the repair process. And uh, you have to pass through each stage because if you compromise this, you are going to end up with problems here. So each step has to be properly executed and then you move on to the next step. So how do you correct the cordy? The cordy is corrected one by extensively degloving the penis of the shaft of the penis and with that in about 80% of children you correct the cordy, you don't have any more cordy. If despite doing this you have a cordy persisting, the next step to do is to free the urethra from the corporal bodies because the urethra is attached to the bucks fascia and the corporal bodies as we saw in the previous picture. If you are able to free up the urethra from the corporal bodies, those additions give way, the urethra stretches and the cordy can correct itself in another 10%. That's about 90%. You still have a group of about 8-10% of children who have persistent cordy. There are various techniques described about incising tunica, albuginia, etc, etc. I am not going to go in this. As I told you, what I am describing is what is considered to be standard practice. There are always variations. The next step after this is a dorsal plication. So if you cannot get stuff done from the bottom, you go to the top, you go to the dorsal aspect and you plicate so that the bent urethra can now be straightened. And this is corrects the cordy in about the remaining 5 odd percent of patients. And here is where that neurovascular anatomy is important and I'm sure that you, it will be demonstrated as the cases are done. So these are the sort of steps that you go through. You first do this. If it doesn't work, you do this. If it doesn't work, you do this. And in majority of instances, your cordy is corrected. It is also important to realize that the more aggressive you become, suppose you start making incisions on the tunica albuginia and things, at that point of time, it does look like it is working. But later on, results are quite terrible because these tissues undergo scarring. And when they come back at puberty and adulthood, they have pretty severe cordy. Once the cordy is corrected, you go to the next step, that is the urethral restitution. How do you decide? You decide, you answer this question. Can the native urethral plate be preserved? To make it more technical, can axial integrity of the urethral plate be preserved? What you are trying to say, can you get away without cutting the urethral plate? That's what it's asking. If you can, then you decide whether there is enough urethral plate just to tubularize, in which case you can just do a thias tube play. Or if there is less urethral plate and you need to augment it, you augment it with a variety of procedures which use a variety of tissues. All right. You could do a snot grass, you could do a graft, you could do an onlay. So this is how you go. If the urethral plate cannot be preserved, it's of such poor quality that it cannot be used for reconstruction, you just take it off. And then you need to reconstruct the whole urethra, not just the floor of the urethra. And then there are assorted, position, assorted operations for that. You could do a ducket tube, you could use a buccal mucosa tube, you could do a two-stage procedure, etc., etc. And you could bring tissues from elsewhere, you could get inner prepucial skin, you could get buccal mucosa, etc. So this is the sort of broad algorithm based on how you decide. Now within this algorithm, different people have different choices. But most of the time, the standard operations are a few. And if you are aware of most of the way, standard way of doing things, you will be able to individualize application of these standard techniques in a given patient. There is no, we don't have conferences on pylora myotomy because it's a standard, good, 100% successful operation. Because there is one operation, you, impl you put it on a child and it works. Whereas this is not the case here. So different people have different techniques. But what is important is the techniques are based on the same foundation. They are based on the same principles. You might do this way or that way. But they are technical differences rather than basic principle differences. Once you do the urethra, you then repair the rest. You have to achieve a meatus that looks slit like. You need to achieve a glans plasty so that there is some glans tissue under the urethral meatus to support the urethral meatus. You need the furlet collar or the mucosal collar around the glans because that provides you the cosmesis. 
you need to do a spongioplasty so you bring this corpus spongiosum on top of your repaired urethra to support and buttress your repaired urethra you then need to readjust the skin so that the whole penis is covered and if you are one of the people who have who believe in foreskin reconstruction in the more distal varieties hypospedias you can reconstruct the foreskin how do you follow them most of the people will follow them for about a year and then let them go that is not the right thing to do the usual protocol for follow up is described as this you do it at 3 months you see them again at 1 to 2 years you see them again at 4 to 5 years you see them at puberty and you see them at mid teens now why do you do that and at every time they come you ask them for history how are you peeing is everything straight is everything doing fine are you having any dysuria you do a urophlometry to see how the because it's a nice test to follow you do a bladder ultrasound especially in young children to look for emptying to say whether they are emptying their bladder properly and completely and you must realize that whatever you are repairing you are going to cause scar it might be less or more scar but there is going to be scar you are bringing in tissues which are not native to the genital area these are tissues that are not likely to be as androgen sensitive as the other tissues there so eventually over a period of time you are going to have problem especially around puberty when the genitals rapidly grow and you can have a situation where the urethra that you have reconstructed does not grow at the same rate so you tend to have late fistulae you tend to have a scarring which probably in a little baby is all right but once the penis grows the penis is not able to keep up so you end up having strictures that grow late that appear later on you have concerns about how the penis shape looks and you look at them at this age because it allows the patient to verbalize his or her or not her obviously his own concerns so that is important that's the reason why you cannot leave these patients until they are mid teens you have to because that's the when the patient can say what he feels until then it's the parent and mostly the mother who says what she feels uh how do you look how do you decide your outcomes some of them are relatively straightforward meatal position gland shape etc etc there is great discussion among these things amongst the surgeons because these are surgically correctable but there is evidence to say that patients are more bothered about these things about how the penis looks how the glands looks is it thick enough is it long enough now these things are uncorrectable and there is not much discussion on surgical forums but these are of critical importance to patients especially in their teens and that's why you need to see them at that point how is the long term outcomes there's nothing very much to choose most of the operations have a reoperation rate of about 10% these are standard operations magpie this is the snot gas equivalent this is the onlay this is the bucket tube and this is the two stage braca they all have approximately a 10% reoperation rate except the tube which has a 50% reoperation rate so tube probably is not the standard is not probably a very nice operation to do this is a recent article and this is the kind of reoperation rate and this is the kind of long term stricture rates all others there is nothing really very much to choose as i told you long term outcomes cosmesis is important issues persist and there was a survey of lay of teenagers and young adults who had hypospedias repair and about 50% of them would have liked to have so called tidying up procedures if that was offered to them so obviously half these patients are not still happy with the way their penis looks sexual function psychological issues are things that are now coming up about 40% patients have residual curvature this is across the board about 40% so though the penis looks nice when we operate and about 6 months later it all looks very straight about half of them will end up having some residual curvature because your repair does not grow and does not respond to androgens at puberty like the rest of the penis this is more so in posterior hypospedias about 75% do have good erections but only a very small amount have satisfactory ejaculations basically because there is no bulbo cavernosus and various other muscles to actually propel the ejaculate so there are issues that persist if you look at western literature there is a lot about sexual contact and age of sexual initiation etc etc um, thankfully these are or at least i hope they are not major issues in our country yet but i'm sure as time passes these are going to become issues so to summarize technical issues have much improved we can assure most patients with anterior hypospedias that their outcomes are going to be excellent and only if you have surgical mishaps that your outcomes are going to worsen so if you do a good operation most likely your anterior hypospedias are going to do well the posterior hypospedias the situation is less than ideal we do achieve anatomy when they are young but the anatomy changes when they grow older and often there are psychological and psychosexual issues that remain to be defined so ladies and gentlemen the fascination never ends have a great workshop thank you thank you uh, sanjay for a very clear as usual very clear and masterly cl class to all of us on hypospedias thank you very much so we'll uh...